Good morning, Dr. Phil here. Today we'll be discussing on brainstem death testing. Introduction Cranial nerve reflexes are the underlying basis for brainstem death test. Kindly refer to the video discussing cranial nerves for further details. Altered consciousness Components of consciousness include arousal, which is the ability to experience one's surroundings, and awareness, which is the ability to understand one's relationship to one's surroundings, with attentiveness being the degree of awareness. Examples of altered states of consciousness Anxiety or lethargy Awareness is intact Attentiveness is altered With attentiveness increased in anxiety and reduced in lethargy Locked in state Arousal and awareness are intact There is almost total absence of motor responsiveness Typical cause is bilateral injury to the motor pathways in the ventral pons which disrupts all voluntary movements except up-down ocular movements and eyelid blinking. Delirium and dementia Arousal is intact. Awareness is altered. In delirium, awareness is fluctuating. In dementia, awareness is slowly progressively deteriorating. Vegetative state Some degree of arousal is still present. The eyes can still open. However, there is no awareness. Movements, if present, are purposeless. Persistent vegetative state occurs when vegetative state persists for one month or more. Coma. There is total absence of arousal and awareness. Movements, if present, are purposeless. Brain death. There is total absence of arousal and awareness. Brain death differs from coma as brain death involves loss of all brainstem function including cranial nerve activity and spontaneous respiration. Brain death is always irreversible. Common causes of altered consciousness include traumatic or ischemic brain injury, encephalopathy, encephalitis, non-convulsive seizures, toxic drug ingestion, ethanol withdrawal, dehydration, thyroid disorders, medications, line sepsis, hypoxia, hypercapnia, low cardiac output, circulatory shock, hepatic failure, hypoglycemia, adrenal insufficiency, uremia and urosepsis. Selected conditions that alter pupil size and their reactivity in patients with altered consciousness. If both pupils are dilated and reactive, causes include atropine, anticholinergic toxicity, adrenergic agonists such as dopamine, stimulant drugs such as amphetamine, and non-convulsive seizures. If both pupils are dilated but non-reactive, causes include diffuse brain injury, hypothermia less than 28 degrees Celsius, intracranial hypertension, brainstem compression from an intracranial space-occupying lesion that is increasing in size. If both pupils are unequal and unreactive, causes include expanding intracranial mass, such as during uncle herniation, ocular trauma or surgery, focal seizure. If both pupils are normal in size and reactive, causes include toxic or metabolic encephalopathy, sedative overdose, neuromuscular blockade. If both pupils are normal in size but non-reactive, causes include acute liver failure, post-anoxic encephalopathy, and brain death. If only one pupil is constricted but both pupils are reactive, causes include Horner syndrome. If both pupils are constricted but reactive, causes include opioid overdose, toxic or metabolic encephalopathy. If both pupils are constricted and non-reactive, causes include pontine injury. Definitions Death The Uniform Determination of Death Act states that death occurs when an individual has sustained either irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory functions or irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain, including the brainstem, i.e. brain death. Brain death describes the situation in which a patient has undergone the irreversible loss of any capacity for consciousness together with the irreversible loss of the ability to breathe. Essential components of brain death include irreversible coma, absence of brainstem reflexes, and absence of spontaneous respirations during a CO2 challenge. Preconditions for brain death testing a definitive diagnosis of the cause of coma, which is sufficient to account 
for irreversible brain death must be present. Apneic coma. The patient should be in an apneic coma with a GCS score of 3. No eye opening, no verbal response and no movement to pain. Body temperature should be more than 36 degrees Celsius or more than 96.8 degrees Fahrenheit. No sedatives. There should be no residual depressant drugs in the patient's body which in practice may mean substantial delay until clearance can be assured. Observation over four elimination half-lives is commonly recommended. If the patient received longer acting drugs such as barbiturates to control convulsive activity or if there is a suspicion of illicit drug use, plasma determinations of sedative drug levels may be indicated. But if the intracranial catastrophe is obvious and extreme, some clinicians do not believe them to be necessary. Patients scheduled for brain death tests may be sedated with short-acting agents whose elimination can be predicted with some confidence if sedation was indicated. There should be no neuromuscular blockade. This should be excluded by using a peripheral nerve stimulator. There should be no metabolic derangements. There must be no endocrine or metabolic disturbance that may contribute to continued coma. Normal glycemia normal thyroid and adrenal function should be confirmed. There should be no shock. There should be no impaired circulatory function that is compromising cerebral perfusion. Systolic blood pressure should be more than 100 mm mercury. There should be normal capnia. Hypercapnia can obtain cerebral function and this must be kept normal for that patient. Cranial nerve reflexes tested during brain death testing. Brain death tests aim to confirm the absence of brain stem reflexes and examine cranial nerves which are amenable to testing. Two sets of brain death tests are performed. Although there is no set interval between them, they are usually done a few hours apart. Performer of brain death test The diagnosis of brain death should be made by two medical practitioners trained and experienced in the field. Thus, brain death tests are performed by two doctors where both doctors have been registered for more than 5 years, one of whom must be a consultant, neither should be a member of the transplant team. There has never been a reported case of a patient who initially satisfied the criteria for brain stem death and who subsequently failed to do so. Cranial nerve 1 is not tested in brain death testing. Cranial nerve 2, pupillary light reflex, direct and consensual is tested to assess the optic nerve together with the parasympathetic constrictor outflow. Pupillary size is not important. There is absent pupillary light reflex if brain death occurred. Cranial nerves 3, 4 and 6 are tested using the oculocephalic reflex and the oculovestibular reflex. The oculocephalic reflex is used to test whether the eyes move with the head, which is abnormal, instead of maintaining central gaze. Ensure the cervical spine is cleared, the patient's eyes are held open, the head is briskly turned from side to side, with the head held briefly at the end of each turn. A positive response occurs when the eyes rotate to the opposite side to the direction of head rotation, thus indicating that the brain stem is intact. A similar result is seen when the head is flexed and extended. A positive result is downward deviation of the eyes during neck extension and upward deviation during neck flexion. The eyelids, if closed, may also open as part of the doll's head phenomenon. These vertical responses indicate that the brain stem is intact. The eyes should gradually return to the mid position in a smooth conjugate movement if the brain stem is intact. Oculocephalic reflex is absent if brain death occurred. The oculovestibular reflex will be discussed later. Cranial nerves 5 and 7 are tested using the corneal reflex and response to painful stimuli. There is absent corneal reflex if brain death occurred. Painful stimuli are applied to the face as supraorbital or infraorbital pressure, the limbs as nail bed pressure, and the trunk as sternal stimulation. A stimulus is applied above the neck level due to the possibility of tetraplegia. There is no facial grimacing in response to a noxious stimuli if brain death occurred. Cranial nerve 8 is tested using the oculovestibular reflex and the oculocephalic reflex discussed earlier. 
First establish that both eardrums are visible and intact. 50 ml of ice cold water is instilled into the external auditory canal of each ear via a syringe. If brainstem function is intact, both eyes will deviate slowly towards the irrigated ear. Conjugate eye movement is lost and nystagmus is absent if the lower brainstem is damaged. The eyes should be observed for at least 1 minute after each injection. Cranial nerves 9 and 10 are tested by stimulating the pharynx, larynx and trachea such as by passing a suction catheter into the pharynx and down the ETT. The patient should neither gag nor cough if brain death occurred. Cranial nerves 11 and 12 are not tested in brain death testing. The apnea test. Prerequisites are mentioned in the previous section. Apnea test is done last to avoid unnecessary hypercapnia should any of the other reflexes be present. Prior to the apnea test, the patient is ventilated with 100% oxygen for 10 minutes, the respiratory rate is reduced to 10 breaths per minute and PEEP set to 5 cmH2O, minute ventilation is reduced to achieve a PaCO2 of 45 mmHg or 6 kPa, and arterial blood gas is obtained if the SpO2 is more than 95% to establish the baseline PaCO2. The patient is disconnected from the ventilator. Apneic oxygenation via a tracheal catheter is used to maintain oxygen saturation. 8 liters per minute of 100% oxygen is delivered via the tracheal catheter. In the apneic patient, PaCO2 rises by 0.4 to 0.8 kPa per minute or 3 to 6 mmHg per minute. Thus, a test period of 6 to 7 minutes should be sufficient for achieving the target PaCO2. The rise in PaCO2 depends on the metabolic rate, thus it may take some time to reach the arterial blood gas level required by the testing criteria, which is 60 mmHg or 20 mm mercury above the baseline PaCO2. Look closely for respiratory movements. Measure PaO2, PaCO2 and pH after 10 minutes and reconnect the ventilator. If respiratory movements are absent, and arterial PCO2 is 60 mmHg or 20 mm mercury increase from baseline PACO2, then the apnea test is positive and this supports the diagnosis of brain death. Abort the apnea test and connect the ventilator back to the patient if systolic blood pressure drops below 90 mm mercury, SPO2 drops below 85% for more than 30 seconds, or cardiac arrhythmias occur. Immediately draw an arterial blood sample to analyze the ABG. If arterial PCO2 is less than 60 mmHg or less than 20 mmHg increase from baseline PACO2, the apnea test result is indeterminate and additional confirmatory tests can be considered. The Lazarus sign. Brain dead patient can exhibit brief spontaneous movements of the head, torso or upper extremities especially after they are removed from the ventilator, which stem from neuronal discharges in the cervical spinal cord, possibly in response to hypoxemia. Further confirmatory tests. None of these tests are required in the UK, but other countries may require these under certain circumstances. Ancillary tests for the diagnosis of brain death includes auditory, visual and somatosensory evoked potentials, absence of evoked potentials is consistent with brain death, EEG. A flat EEG is consistent with brain death. To confirm the lack of circulation to the brain, transcranial Doppler, MRA and CTA can be employed. These tests are typically used when the neurologic examination is equivocal or when apnea testing cannot be performed safely. Disadvantages of ancillary tests for the diagnosis of brain death includes there is insufficient evidence to determine if ancillary testing can reliably identify brain death. Current guidelines on brain death determination caution physicians about the use of these tests. Potential pitfalls and other considerations. There should be no pitfalls if the preconditions are fully satisfied and brain death tests are performed with scrupulous care. The diagnosis of brain death should not be normally considered until at least 6 hours after the onset of an apneic coma, 24 hours after the restoration of circulation if the cause was a cardiac arrest, 
If therapeutic hypothermia was used, the test should be performed at least 24 hours after the restoration of normal thermia. Time of death. Death is confirmed after the second set of brain death tests. The time of death is recorded as the completion of the first set of brain stem death criteria. Lesions which mimic brain death includes severe Guillain-Barre and Miller-Fisher syndromes, Bickerstaff's brain stem encephalitis, which is characterized by acute progressive cranial nerve dysfunction associated with ataxia, coma, and apnea. There are no structural abnormalities of the brain. The clinical picture is one of brain stem death. This condition is reversible. Ventral pontine infarction associated with lock-in syndrome can mimic brain death. Bilateral ventral pontine lesions may involve both corticospinal and corticobalba tracts. Tetraplegia and locked-in syndrome may occur. The affected patients are unable to speak or produce facial movements. However, they can usually blink and move their eyes vertically. As the tegmentum of the pons is spat, they remain sensate, fully conscious, and aware. Meaningful recovery from locked-in syndrome is extremely rare. Children Theoretically, clinical criteria are the same as in adults. However, CNS immaturity in neonates raises doubts about the validity of brainstem death tests and there are anecdotal evidence of children who have recovered substantial neurological function despite severe neurological insult and prolonged coma. These are my references. Thank you.